Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here again. It's been a busy few days. Here on Drum Talk TV, come to you from Globe, Arizona, 100 miles east of Phoenix up in the mountains. Tell us where you're watching from. And I'm here with my co-host, I'm actually the co-host, the host, Dr. Nadia Azar from the University of Windsor, a professor of kinesiology here to talk about drumming related injuries, but it might also apply to guitarists or anybody that moves parts of their body repetitively. Hi, Nadia. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Great, how are you doing? Pretty good. Good. Pretty good. Great to be doing this again. Uh, folks, this is typically a monthly thing, but when you have kids that are of Nadia's kids' ages, summer sometimes causes little interruptions, but she's back with us. I'm very excited about it. So the show is about drumming-related injuries. So that could be tendonitis, carpal tunnel, arthritis, bursitis, um, sore uh, shoulder arches, lower back pain, hip displacement, all kinds of things, right, Nadia? Yeah, absolutely. Anything that sort of develops over time as a result of playing the drums is what we're talking about here. Yeah, and Nadia's here to kind of guide you on some possibilities that could help you get past them or prevent them. If you have any of these ailments and you believe they're for drumming, from drumming, go ahead and comment. If you've never had any of these types of injuries and you're a drummer, we'd love to know that too, because we'd love to, Nadia will ask some questions that might help uncover what you've done, even unknowingly, as preventative maintenance, because sometimes the ergonomics of your kit and or the way you play is enough to cause injury, right, Nadia? What would some examples be so they know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so depending on how you have your kit set up, it's really important to set it up to fit your body. Um, so some examples might be, you know, sometimes people like to set their cymbals up really high and really far out, which looks great while you're playing and that sort of thing, but it puts a lot of stress on your shoulders to reach that far. And especially when you're putting a lot of force into the motion. And so over time, over the years, you know, it could be a couple of years, it could be five years, it could be 20 years, but eventually it can catch up with you and start causing problems. Right. Um, so those are the kinds of things that you want to try to reduce so that you can maintain your playing longevity and keep going for as long as you want to. Exactly. And I gotta ask, is that a new tattoo? Uh, not really. I've had it since 2019. Oh, actually. really? Why not? Awkward angle. <laughs> I don't remember it. Why I didn't it? have it when I came out to the studio. I got it, uh, yeah, about three years ago. After, probably shortly after that. Well, it'll be four yeah. years next month. Can you believe that? Yeah, I know. That's it's crazy. crazy. Nadia was here and we did a three day part of a study that she was doing at the time. And she was here and for three days each day. Here's what we did. The first day I played about 45 minutes or so of Led Zeppelin. The next day, 45 minutes or so of Rush. Nadia's in Canada, so I had to honor that. And um, the third day, I think, was just all progressive rock. And each day, Nadia mm -hmm. put electrodes on me and measured heart rate and calorie burn. And we had a contest yeah. of whoever guessed closest to calorie burn each day. And I think overall across the three mm -hmm. days and everything. Um, that was fun. So that, that, that was fun. Nadia was here. Yeah, we should do that again. Yeah. Hey, now that you can yeah. travel again. I know, right? And I've got all kinds of new stuff that we can try out. Ooh. like. That's vibration true. and muscle activation Ooh. and all kinds of stuff like that. And so. I have the other drum set set up as well. So you'd be able to play with me. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> if we plan it far enough in advance, maybe. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll see you next Thursday. <laughs> yeah, <done. laughs> I, and folks, I'm going to check in over here. Uh, not on Gilligan's Island, but this is where I could see the show. Just like you folks, I could see comments, questions, things like that. We'd love to hear from you. Don't be shy. This is a friendly environment. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know if you believe any of your injuries that we mentioned, carpal mm -hmm. tunnel, tendonitis, arthritis, bursitis, lower back pain, shoulder arches, knee pain, ankle pain, hip pain, a, a boil on your, now that wouldn't count. 
Um, no. An earache from your lead singer doesn't count, but we'll hear <laughs> you out if you need a shoulder to cry on. Anything like that, go ahead and tell us and ask questions, give feedback. Let's see, there's a few comments. Wow. Let's start with Andres Hernandez says, ergonomics and how to touch drum set and thus take care of the body. The drum is the best exercise for the body. Good vibes from Chile. Thanks for chiming in. That's such an interesting point because just like going to the gym, drums are one of the best things you could do for exercise. It's aerobic and all of those things. Yet you can injure yourself just like at the gym, lifting too much weight, lifting improperly, using a piece of exercise equipment improperly. It's, it's really very much related, isn't it? It is. And it's very much related in terms of the overuse. You know, athletes are subject to overuse injuries if they ramp up their training too quickly, like their volume of training too quickly or too much intensity too soon. Um, or for too long. So the same thing can happen with drummers. If you, you know, you, you get a gig and you got to start practicing and you go from playing, you know, half an hour a day to three hours a day without gradually increasing it, you're, you're putting a lot of stress on your body. And it's very similar um, and, and similar types of injuries. Uh, you know, the tendonitis the muscle strains, that sort of thing um, can happen in the same way for drummers as it does for athletes. Absolutely. Um, Gosh, I'm realizing I should have let my drum student, hi, Marty, I should have let one of my drum students know that we were doing this show because he practices for like four hours a day. Um, and he, he's only wow. nine. No, I'm kidding. He's, he's 16. <laughs> and I remember when I used to play that much because I was in bands, you know, from like the mid to late 70s to the late 80s playing a lot up and down the sunset strip in Hollywood, touring, recording, rehearsing. If I wasn't kicking, we were rehearsing. If we weren't rehearsing, I was rehearsing. And when it, his dad told me, you know, yeah, he works out like four hours a day on the drum. So I'm thinking I could never do that right now. And I mm. believe I have the stamina, but as we've talked about on this show, I have trigger finger and I'll get to updates on that. Mostly in this finger, it was in both ring fingers for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. and a lot of nerve damage from playing over 52 years now. I know, folks, I should be better. But the thought of playing that long, but I'm going to have to um, work on that because I've backed off so much that I'm playing mm -hmm. about once a week. I'm starting to ease back into, eh, I feel like playing. I'll go play. But I actually got fearful of playing, like I was going to hurt myself because I was having so much nerve damage pain in in both these hands um mm -hmm. and arthritis i'm at that age but it's not just an older person's affliction younger people can get arthritis as well of course so the gloves are on the way to you there's this new glove yeah. box that i'll be talking about and debuting that's made for arthritis uh people people with arthritis not arthritis people uh yeah the people over at arthritis incorporated and it's actually helped a lot. And for my nerve damage pain, I'm actually taking a supplement that a friend of mine, who's one of the most sought out hand surgeons um, in the country, I've, I've talked to you about maybe having him on with us, actually. Um, I'm taking some supplements that are his brand of supplements, and they've actually not only been helping the nerve damage, but it's lowering my blood sugar, which is great because folks, if you don't know, I'm diabetic. And I didn't find out I was diabetic till three years ago as a senior already. That was bizarre. So all kinds of new improvements, but I've been kind of afraid to like just jump back in and start playing a lot. And that's my point. You got to ease back into it once you do get hurt or hurt yourself from overplay or ergonomics or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, if you think about like, if you wanted to start running, you're not going to go out and run, you know, three miles. Right the first time you go and start running like three miles a day, every day, you're going to start with, you know, maybe one mile and walk some of it exactly. and then gradually increase it. And it's the same thing, you know, to try to avoid overtaxing your body, you want to ramp up gradually um, yeah. so that you don't run into some of these issues and treat it like a workout, even sitting down with like mm -hmm. one of these, a hand drum, do a warm up do your thing and do a cool down as well. It's really the same. 
Um, oh yeah. And the, the, the warm up, you know, when, when you talk about warm up, it's not just about, you know, doing some rudiments on, on your practice pad. Right. It's, it's a full, especially if you're going to be like playing a show or practicing it's for a long rate time of, of what you're doing, lack of intensity at first. It's yeah, but you, you need to warm up your whole body. Like you need yeah. to get your heart rate elevated. You need to get some dynamic movement happening in your major joints and then get on your practice pad, like your instrument specific warm up. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, Mark Clement Jr. says I do yoga and martial arts and it keeps me healthy and relaxed when I play, but I have started having some hand pain and a slight problem with trigger finger in one hand, not my lead hand. Oops. It moved on me. Not my lead hand, but my snare drum backbeat hand. I try to do quite a bit of stretching and the pain does not bother me when I'm playing, but bothers me when I am not playing. So don't not hmm. play. Just kidding. <laughs> um, what, what do you make of that? That, um, well, first of all, let's address what causes trigger finger. My doctor said, and tell me if you know of other causes, he says mine is caused from little nodes or nodules that develop on the tendon mm -hmm. and that that's what's caused the trigger finger for some weird reason only on both my ring fingers are there other causes of trigger finger um i'm not i mean that's essentially what because this is your your hand surgeon that you're talking about right no this, actually my regular like... doctor oh okay that. yeah um, so your, your hand surgeon guy would be a great person to ask for the more yeah. specifics about that. But yeah, trigger finger happens when, like you say, those nodules develop on your tendons. And basically what happens is when you bend your fingers, the nodules kind of slip under these sheaths. And then when you try to, they get stuck. So you oh. can't actually slip it through and, and release the finger. So you're, you're limited in movement there. Um, why they happen, uh, there are a lot of different reasons why but some of it is from the repet like it could be from repetitive motions it could be i mean i don't i haven't watched your hand technique that closely so i don't know you know but um rapid finger movements especially forceful uh, or even forceful gripping i think is another mm -hmm. one that can cause that i know um there has been some links between diabetes and development of oh. trigger finger i don't now, know a ton about sense, it because it all came about around the same time now that i think about it yeah and actually i remember looking into it briefly like the, one of the first times we talked about it because i didn't think i didn't know that there was a link or whether there was a link and i did see some studies that said that yeah there has been a, a connection there and i don't know why um I, I didn't get that far into it but um yeah so the the repetitive movements the forceful movements can lead to that and that's that's essentially what um, what happens is that your fingers have trouble. The tendons don't slide through the sheaths as, as smoothly as they should, and they get stuck in place. Interesting. I'm also mm -hmm. realizing that I have trigger finger in my ring fingers, and my doctor's name is Dr. Ring. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let me take a look here. I also want to address something else that uh, Mark mentioned. <clears throat> he mentioned stretching. Um, mm -hmm. and being that he's in yoga and martial arts, I'm guessing he probably knows how to stretch. So we'll say for everybody else, can you talk about proper and improper stretching and the difference between static and dynamic stretching? Yeah, so static stretching means like the stretch and hold, like the typical stretching you're, you're thinking of like stretch and hold and hold it for 30 seconds or whatever it is, that kind of thing. Whereas dynamic stretching is stretching, essentially active stretching, stretching through movement. So things like wrist circles uh, or elbow pivots is dynamic stretching. Um, both of them have their uses, but dynamic stretching is considered to be the better approach to stretching during a warm up. Um, because you're actively moving, your, your muscles and tendons aren't quite warm at that point. So by moving them, you're helping them move through that range of motion. Uh, and you're also, it, it, to move joints, you need muscle activity. So you're also warming up the muscles at the same time. Right. Um, so whereas static stretching is, is better after your activity. So dynamic stretching before you play the drums, static stretching 
as part of your cool down when wow. you're finished Makes sense. to stretch in because your muscles are already warm. So you can probably get a deeper stretch than you would at the beginning. And if you hold it for long enough, you can actually start getting some uh, improvements in range of motion. So that's the difference between the two and, and when you should be doing each of them. And that applies to drumming or any other athletic right. activity. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and then, uh, hey, Joshua VP. Hey, how's it going? He says, hey, Dan. Hey, Nadia. Question from Bel question here from Belgium. You worked with you, Nadia, worked with Mike <laughs> Mangini. Uh, you saw his stick grip. Using from the larger muscle groups, I've been using it for 10 years. Now, sorry, everything keeps moving as people are commenting. Uh, where am I? Now, uh, now, not one day of damage. Any input on working with larger muscle groups? Because mentioning this grip is not making my teachers happy. Ha, ha, ha. His drum teachers, I guess. Yeah. He, so you yeah. know what he's talking about? Um, not, uh, yes and no. I don't know specific, I haven't worked with Mike to specifically study his grip. So I, I don't know exactly the ins and outs of what he's talking about, but uh, I'm familiar with the concept of trying to use larger muscle groups. Um, and I, I mean, it depends what you're doing, I guess. I mean, in some cases, depending on what you're doing, you can't help but use the smaller muscle groups. Right. Um, you know, like if you're doing really fine, like finesse work, you're going to have to use the smaller, you know, intrinsic muscles of your hands yeah. to control the sticks and that kind of thing. Um, you know, but you don't necessarily need to use the smaller muscle groups when you're doing other types of motions. Um, but I think too, a big part of it is even like, you know, using your muscles large or small but only using the amount of muscle force that you really need to get the job done right. um, and to try not to play with a lot of tension um, because it's less efficient you're, you're basically wasting energy with all that tension and you're also making your muscles stiff which then leads to more you know the impact from hitting the drums and cymbals more of that gets transferred into your body which is not necessarily good for it so right. um yeah, I I don't know why that's not making your teachers happy, but um, <laughs> that's probably worth a discussion to to find out why. Yeah, um, absolutely. And Mar uh, Rob Gaber, and thanks for the questions, everybody. Uh, Rob Gaber says two neck surgeries over a six year period after fifty two years of drumming. I believe that scares me. I've been playing over fifty two years. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe much of it is the nodding of the head banging for lack of better terms, Rob from Pocono Mountain in Pennsylvania. Thanks so much, Rob. Well, mm -hmm. that's something we've never talked about. Head banging injuries. And uh, yeah. that can come as a musician or a music fan. Mm -hmm. How interesting, yeah. Neck surgery, two over a six year period. Stop with the head banging. Time to put on some yeah. Mozart. <laughs> Not it's, that you can't uh, yeah. head bang to Mozart. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you could. I know um, I've heard Roy Mayorga talk about this. He's the drummer for Ministry and also for Stone Sour. Yeah. And right. Yeah. And I've heard him talk about he actually had a stroke from headbanging. It's wow. somehow, yeah, I don't remember. I, I, this was several years ago now, so I don't remember the exact, he kind of described why it happened, but it had something to do with the, you know, the motions and it, it created a, a, you know, disturbance in his blood flow. And he actually that makes had a sense. stroke That's from crazy, it. but it makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely, you know, head banging, whether it's on the drums or off, it's, I mean, it's fun, but you do have to be careful with that. You can certainly you know, strain your neck or, you know, <laughs> I'm not even going to nod yes to NJ anymore. <laughs> That's my wife, folks. Blink. Blink. Yeah. <laughs> Mark Clement Jr. also says dealing with diabetes as well, but I keep my weight in check uh, through continues working out and stretching. Although diabetes is under control, I still suffer from it. Interesting conversation. Thanks, Nadia. That's great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I've learned that uh, Thanks, the Mark. more I play, 
the easier it is to keep my diabetes under control. I'm not overweight. I've never been overweight. I struggle to put weight on now in the last three years since I was diagnosed. I don't come from a family of diabetics. I didn't grow up eating candy and you know all that stuff. Um, my doctor deduced that I gave it to myself from being a fruit and juiceaholic, basically. Um, so no more fruit, no more juice. I got to have a little bit of berries and that's, that's it. Uh, but drumming's mm -hmm. great for that. Any active activity, but I also learned it's state of mind because after we got the puppy, the first puppy, who's a year old this month, I, I was running a lot more now and playing with him in the yard and stuff. And I bragged about that to my doctor and he said, it's not necessarily the physical activity. I said, what do you mean? He says, how much joy do you get out of that? And I said, oh my God, I'm crushed on with this dog. I just, and he said, it's a lot of it is state of mind. When you're more relaxed mm -hmm. and you're doing something fun, physical or not that and mm -hmm. i watch my numbers you know i wear my I have my scanner and i scan myself very frequently um we'll see what it is right now just for fun um but this is just such a great device because you could check it before eating after eating before you work out after you work out things like that mm -hmm. it's i'm just slightly out of range it's 130 range for me is one is uh 85 to 125 um, so state of mind has a lot to do with that. So music, drumming, state of mind, mm -hmm. it's all related. Go on and play yeah. to the Yes song, New State of Mind from Open Your Eyes. There you go. Thanks for chiming yeah. in on that. And Brian Cahoon says, ulnar nerve damage in my left arm, pretty severe. Is the ulnar mm. nerve that funny bone nerve? Yeah, that's the one that runs down this yeah. side of your arm and innervates your, basically your, your ring finger in the side Just of your palm here. Hearing you talk about it makes my, I think mine's permanently bruised. Um, mm. So about 40 something years ago when I was, I must've been 18, my parents were on a vacation. Just my sister and I were at home and I was um, not myself the morning after a fun evening, let's just say. And I'm down in the kitchen and my sister, I don't know what was going on. I was jumping off her bed with a friend, banging on the ceiling, had a storming headache. And I kept saying, stop it, stop it. I jumped up to go bang on the ceiling. My hand went through the drywall. My elbow came down on the burner cover of a stovetop with that much force right on the funny bone. That thing oh zinged for like a month. And now if I slightly touch it it's like light getting hit by lightning it's just ridiculous i didn't yeah. tell my parents the real story of how that hole got in the ceiling <laughs> for about 25 or 30 years well no <laughs> I, you gotta I said, save that <laughs> yeah here's here's how bad it was the real story the real story was so bad that i told them that yeah i was a little stoned and there was a a bee in the house and i tried to get it and i went bang and put a hole i didn't tell them i was mad at my sister and hung over and whatever hey i was a, i was 18 give me a break folks <laughs> is is that ulnar nerve damage brian from playing do you think i'd be curious to know um if if you think that's related um mm -hmm. anyone else have any stories of either if you believe you have a drumming related injury, or if you've been playing drums for any length of time and you've never had an injury, we'd love to hear from you. So Nadia can ask a few questions and we could uncover why that is that you don't have injuries. Might be the way you play, might be that your setup is ergonomically just right for you. I changed mm -hmm. my setup slightly about a year ago. Has it been a year? I interviewed, you know, our friend Todd Zuckerman again, and I always wanted to ask him, why is your snare drum like at your chin? It's not mm -hmm. really, but it's pretty. And he said, it's I, yeah, I play traditional grip and I sit low and I have it high so that it's just right where my elbow comes down. I thought I never thought of that. So I lowered my seat only about three inches, which is really a lot in, in this, yeah. in, in the world of a drum setup. It, mm -hmm. And it was, I felt like I was sitting more in the kit and wearing it more rather than approaching it from afar, if you will. Not that I sat high. I sat high when I was young, but I, mm -hmm. I sit pretty where my femurs are almost parallel with the ground, a little bit higher. And then I lowered those three inches and just that little bit made such a difference. I got used to it really quickly and I actually really like it. It's not as That's high great. up on me as his is because his is literally about to the top of his midsection. 
you know, right. I yeah, but given that he plays. Yeah. Yeah. But because of he plays traditional grip so much, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Because that's his snare hand yeah, and that's where that grip, naturally would, lands. I mean, uh, match that, grip. Yeah. Yeah. Be crazy. That wouldn't work. But having it, he also, because I heard him talking at a, he was at a, had a clinic at a guitar center near us one time and we went and, and listened and somebody, he was talking about the height of his snare and how it also had to do with like the mechanics, like how much force he's using to strike. He's like, you don't need all this motion to get that force and right. you don't even need all that force. Right. Um, and now he, I don't think he said this, but especially nowadays, if you're playing like with a mic setup, like you don't have to wail on them for the back of the room to hear it. They're, right. they're going to be projected. So you don't, you can play and play dynamically with lots of, you know, within reason, lots of motion, but you don't have to bash. You can stay relaxed and, and still flow with it and, yeah. and keep your, your muscle tension low while still hitting with enough force to get the sound that you want. And some people, and that's just it, the sound that you want. Some people are playing with all that force, even when the kit's mic'd up because of the sound they get out of the drum when they hit it harder. Mm -hmm. You train your wrist and your fingers you can get a lot of force out of very short motion. I can. I economize because my physical condition has been changing over the years. I economize my motion as much as possible so that I can play really loud without doing this. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. doing it for show. I don't need to do that. So I've been able to train my hands to get a lot of power and sound without full arm, you know, motion. And it mm -hmm. feels good actually to be able to do that. Yeah, definitely. Let's see who else is chiming in. Uh, Joshua says again, oh, drum teachers get angry because it's what they don't know. Mike pretty much went under the radar, but is at the top of the food chain. <laughs> People still use all the Moeller, Gladstone, uh, different grips when figures are uh, constantly working whilst with the grip Sorry, whilst with this grip, thumb and index are only giving the stick direction, other fingers actually rest and do nothing. So in many ways, a strain from the traditional is not always accepted. I get it. That's why, mm -hmm. you know, there's some people that are just so traditional grip. Um, who was I interviewing years ago? At the beginning of Drum Talk TV, I know when it was, because I remember where I was sitting. So it was in our Las Vegas house before I had this other room as an office. That's weird, but I can't remember who it was. Said people ask, it was an educator that was asking, they were saying that people ask him all the time, you know, is that Moeller? Are you playing Moeller? At the time he said, I didn't, and this is an older gentleman. I, I remember that. He was in his 60s. It's not, he said, I don't even know really when I use Moeller or not. You know, it's mm. not... It's a style of motion, but it's there are no rules, you know, and, and I think sometimes people put on their lab coats and they get so caught up in, you know, watching a video. Oh, your pinky's sticking out. Well, if you didn't watch the video, would you know that by the person's playing? You know, it, it's like whatever people can jump on and criticize, um, like with my kit, a lot of people are saying, oh, my God, you don't have bottom heads on your drums like why no rezo heads why and and most people don't even know what the rezo head does you know i happen to like the sound without bottom heads i'm an older guy old school old school music old school setup that's how i get my sound so it's mm -hmm. it's interesting what people will comment on with what little they know about it so so that's a, a great point well taken and <laughs> rob says no mozart <laughs> <laughs> very funny any yeah, other Brian. questions? Oh, Brian does say, whatever is most comfortable for you. Exactly, exactly. And experiment regarding ergonomics of the kit. Don't just go by what looks cool or what you've seen other people do or the setup you've been playing for three, five, 10 years. Experiment and move stuff around. Make it lower, make it closer, make it farther. If you have long arms, long limbs, like I don't have, and stuff's too close, you can develop an injury that way. Mm -hmm. um, so it also won't be very efficient playing because your muscles, your muscles 
are most efficient at generating force at their natural resting length. Right. So not too short and not too stretched out. So exactly. if you're playing everything in like too close, you're not going to be able to get enough force. You want to have, but you also don't want to be way out here where you also can't generate enough force. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the point about whatever is most comfortable for you, it's yes. Um, I mean, you want it. You want to start with like the general guidelines. Like, there's there's no hard and fast rules. Like, I can't remember who said it, but you know, there are guidelines for like this is how in general you should probably look at. At least this is the starting point for setting up. But what's like ergonomic for me is not going to be ergonomic for you. Is not going to be ergonomic for a six foot four drummer. Yeah. Uh, you know, exactly. so there there are guidelines, but you also have to. Like you say, you know, yes, this is like by the book, how I'm supposed to set that up, but is this comfortable and working for my body? Um, the flip side of that though, the caveat is that sometimes what's comfortable now is still not necessarily good for your body and might become uncomfortable down the line. Especially when so, motion's involved. Especially when motion's involved. And so it's, it's a good idea to have someone, especially someone who ideally someone who understands both drumming and you know ergonomics and human movement to look at how you're drumming and say okay yeah this looks fine but you might want to move your throne down just a bit to get your legs a little more flat or you might want to break this yeah. in a little closer or move this out a little further um to kind of help tweak some of those things um because yeah, like what what might be comfortable right now? What's what's comfortable when you're 21 is probably not going to be comfortable when you're 45 or um, older. Or older. So, um, yeah, like that. So there, there's like whatever is most comfortable, but there is like a little star next to that of like, but yeah. you know, there there are some things that you you know, there are considerations there that sometimes it might be uncomfortable trying to learn a new positioning, but it's worth it because it's actually going to be better for you in the long run. Exactly. Um, yeah. I was looking back there because I've got some pictures of me playing from the old days on the wall. And I'm, I think the picture I'm looking for might be in here. It is. So it's, it's hard to tell, but you can see folks how high my toms are. Look how high the mount is off of the bass drum. And it's the same set I have now. It's just slightly set up differently, but I sat and played fairly high. Everything's fairly high. Right now, my um, two toms are shifted. Uh, looking at the picture, they're shifted to the right and they're almost touching the bass drum. They're not, the one drum is not over the middle of it or it would be touching. I sit and have everything set up so much lower. And here's kind of a polarizing topic. Um, so guys and girls who play drums, who have the bass drum set up right in the middle, facing out center stage, and your hi-hats over here. So you're kind of, oh, you can't see me. Uh, I want to show everybody this. Yeah, Hold I can kind of. Okay, so a lot of us set up bass drums here, audiences there, hi-hats here. And we're playing like this and our body's twisted, especially if you're going over here on the ride. What if you're doing a roll over to your, now you're doing this. So we naturally sit like this. Think of how a double bass drum kit is set up. The two bass drums are in the front where your feet normally fall sitting in a chair. So my bass drum on my big blue kit is now facing that way because I have my hi-hat and my bass drum pedal, my main bass drum pedal set up where my feet would normally fall. And I have my second pedal. I play a single bass drum. I'm not a double pedal guy, but once in a while I'll throw in a, you know, it's just right next to my hi-hat pedal. So I'm sitting how I normally would sit in a chair and there's no twisting just to play on my ride or whatever. A lot of people have a hard time getting their head around that because Oops. We are so uh, traditional sometimes in our setup and the way we've seen Buddy Rich, Gene Krupa, you know, Max Roach, Papa Joe Jones, all these people from the 40s, 50s, 60s set up. Well, that must be how you do it. That's what's wonderful about the drums. It's not like a piano where the keys are always in the same place. It's not yeah, like a saxophone. The same height. 
Yeah, right, where the valves and buttons are always in the same place. It's not mm -hmm. like a guitar where the strings are always in the same order. You could do whatever works for your body type because it's a full, if you have four limbs, and I'm not making a joke about that, if you do have four limbs, some drummers don't, it is a full body thing. Therefore, it could never be set up the same way for everybody. There's just no way. Mm -hmm. So moving that so drum many... over there made such a difference for me, Nadia. Yeah. And there are so many products out there. Like I know a lot of people don't necessarily like the way that looks like they don't, if they only have one bass drum, but there's, I know there, and I can't remember the name of the pedal right now, but there's, there's this. It, oh, pedal it's called that the you offset. Can, the offset pedal where it's yeah. actually, so you can actually put your, your bass drum right in front of your snare drum. The beaters but the pedals, are in the middle, but your feet the are. The beaters are in the middle and the pedals are out to the side so that your feet are in, your legs are in that natural position. So again, you're not doing that twisting. So that's like, there's how There's all I kinds got, of stuff out there. Yeah, that's how I got sold on this. My friend, uh, uh, Philip Gelb of Phoenix Drum Company, Ooh. that's what my hammered brass snare is, a little plug for Philip there on my big blue kit. He <laughs> had one of those. And I was over at his house and I, I thought, this is whack. But, but he s explained exactly what I just explained. I thought, that makes sense. So I'm just going to move my, because I wasn't playing a double pedal kit. So I just moved my drum over. And folks, when you see my show, Dan's Almost Daily Vlog, when I'm playing in my studio on the big blue kit, when the front camera is on, you might not even be able to tell because of where the camera just happens to be. The other drum set is in the way sort of for, so you're kind of seeing it and it looks like it's head on, but it's not. It's cocked to about, that's probably 20 degrees, maybe something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's worth a try. Give it a try, give it a try. Um, mm -hmm. Brian Cahoon also says 72 inch reach was only cool for Muhammad Ali. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, mobility from diabetes broke me from extreme reach. Interesting. Not mm -hmm. likely Kenny G. I think that's in regards to the valves being in different places, maybe. Funny yeah. stuff. <laughs> Nadia, I know you have to go soon. So out of respect for your time, any closing words, advice, wisdom, demands, anything for demands. our viewers or <laughs> listeners uh, to make sure that they protect themselves? Oh, burned. okay. My, my favorite one to fall back on is, is the warm up. is if you want, I think it was Dave Elich who said you, when you start playing your show, you want to feel like you're three songs in already. So like, don't start F your show cold and you warm mean, up. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Physically. Like you don't, you want to start the show already as loose as if you had been playing three songs in. And I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. You want to start you know, whether it's your practice, your show, you want to warm up to, and, and again, that full body warm up, jog it on the spot for 30 to 60 seconds, and then do some dynamic, you know, wrist circles, shoulder circles, elbow pivots. It doesn't have to be, it's like, you know, five to 10 minutes. It's not a significant investment of time, yeah. but it is a significant investment in your physical health and your playing longevity. And so this that's, that's going to be my soapbox moment for the day. And, and soapbox <laughs> it is. And well taken. Yeah. <laughs> Brian Cohn says volume. I'm not sure what that's in reference to, but, and sorry, mm -hmm. folks, we have a new puppy and she's going nuts and encouraging the other dog to bark. The, what you just said, I have a confession. I don't do that. And I know mm -hmm. I should. And one of the reasons I don't do it, it's, it's more of an unconscious decision. Like I'm, I'm working in my office, I'm doing this, that, the other thing, and oh, it's time to go do the show or give a lesson. And I go down to the studio and just sit down and start doing it like an idiot. In the room next to me, I have a, a treadmill, an elliptical, a, a mat, I've got weights. I, I should be warming up before I play. I really have no excuse. Two dogs to run around with, a cat that loves to play. And I don't do it. What an idiot. And I'm 59. I should be taking better care of myself with the warm up. Sometimes I do remember to do the cool down, though. That's good, because yeah. that's just as important. Bring but I'm going to give you some homework. Gradually. What's that? I want to give you some homework. Give I want me next some time. Homework. Next time we meet, I want you to warm up, like do like even five minutes of warming up before you're going to play and okay. like write, write down how your playing went on the days that you warmed oh, up versus like didn't. It. 
Okay. And, and, and see if you can figure out a, you know, see if you feel any different. Yeah. In a lot of ways, the nerve stuff going on and just Mm -hmm. overall, I like that a lot. Um, and, and Nadia and I are going to pick a, another date right after this. So you'll all find yes. out when we're playing Follow Drum Talk TV on Facebook, where we do these live. But we're also on YouTube, Instascam, Instagram, um, Vimeo. And I, yes, according to Steve and my son, we're still tickling Twitter. So we're, we're all over the place. Wherever you're seeing this, if you want to see them live, as well as the interviews, they always happen live on the Facebook page. So, folks, thanks for chiming in with your questions and comments. And everybody else, thanks for following what we do, whether you're watching the live or the archive. And Nadia, thank you so much from your office at work at the University of Windsor. Appreciate you coming in and sharing all your wisdom so we can all stay healthy. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I love being back. So Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Okay, bye.